Hello, Westside Family Church. It's great to be back. For those of you in the North Sanctuary, the South Sanctuary, our Speedway campus, always love for those of you who join us online. A a special shout out to Mitch, who is watching us today from Trinidad, Colorado. Let's give it up for all those watching online. Thank you guys so much for coming. Wow, I got a lot to talk to you about, a lot to cover today, so let's dive in. Um, I want to start off with uh, two questions, a series of questions. I'm going to ask you to respond with a yes or no. I think you'll follow my logic here, okay? First question, answer yes or no. Those of you watching online, get ready to answer yes or no as well. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to a relationship with God the Father and eternal life? Yes or no? Okay, let me ask it again. Do you really believe, I mean really believe, that Jesus is the O-N-L-Y, only, you heard me say that, right? The only way to a relationship with the God, the Father, and entrance into the eternal kingdom? Yes or no? Okay, wow. It's pretty confident. Second question. Do you believe There is unlimited room for those who believe. Yes or no? Yes. Let me ask you again. This is a big question. Do you really believe that there is space still available for anybody, regardless of what they have done in this life? Uh I upped the ante on you. Consider that carefully. Regardless of what they've done in this life, if they bow their knee to Jesus, yes or no? Yes. I think I believe you, actually. So then doesn't it make sense that if you say yes to question one and question two, that we would be passionate about sharing this news with others? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Because here's the deal. At some point, someone invited you. At some point, someone invited you. Someone uh, helped you begin your journey of introducing you to God. Now, we know that one in 14 people who are at Westside Family Church are here, but they have yet to cross the line of faith. And that's okay, but you are here, and someone invited you into this journey, and you are getting very close. Maybe that person who invited you was a parent or a friend, a coworker, a fellow student. For me, the person who invited me first was a neighbor uh, two doors down. Fast forward, I eventually become a pastor and I'm at a church in Fort Worth where I served for 16 years. And on this particular Sunday, when we were moving into a brand new facility on 80 acres of land, the church surprised me by having Ray and Mary Graham, the couple who first invited me, to fly from Cleveland, Ohio, to Fort Worth, Texas, to surprise me. And I was up speaking on the stage, and they walked up. And I have a picture in my office, and you're going to see this picture many, many times, because I am blown away at the generosity of this couple in inviting me to church. And my claim to fame is I said yes. Here's a picture of Ray and Mary Graham. You can see that I just lost it when Ray and Mary Graham were there. You know what? Uh, Even to this day, 45 years in, whenever I'm traveling about on Facebook or wherever, they will reach out and tell me how proud they are of me and the ministry. And I always take as an opportunity to tell them, thank you, that I am eternally grateful that you reached out to me. Where would my life be if they had not? I mean, I have eternal life. I'm not sure that any one of us fully grasp how cool that is yet, but one day I think we're going to really grasp it. And, and not only do I have eternal life, but I have hope today. Regardless of my life circumstances right now, no matter how bad it gets in this life right now, I know this is not how my story ends because I have hope. But even more than that, I have abundant life. And over these last 45 years, I've learned of the teachings of Jesus, and it has helped me greatly. I mean, I'm, not, I'm utterly convinced that I would not have survived 38 years of marriage 
and had the opportunity to raise my children in principles that give life and to have the legacy that I have now had it not been for the teachings of Jesus. I am so incredibly grateful. And this is the very essence of what we want to talk about today. It is the very essence of this 10th and final spiritual practice. Over the last 10 weeks, we have been talking about the top 10 spiritual practices, the top 10 things the Bible encourages you to engage in to practice your faith. And we've come to this last one. And it's an important one called sharing my faith. And there's so many things that were tucked into this chapter in your Believe book, but there's three things specifically I want to share with you that hopefully will motivate you and encourage you and inspire you. If you're taking notes, write this first one down. God calls us to share our faith. God calls us to share our faith. On page 322 of your Believe book, or in the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 19, the apostle Paul writes, and he speaking of God, has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. This passage of scripture was not written to pastors or missionaries, but written to every single person who has taken hold of the free gift of life through Jesus Christ. What an awesome responsibility that we have. God is making his appeal to people that he wants to be in a relationship. He's making that appeal through us. And I don't know about you, but I sometimes look up to God and I say to him, are you sure this is your best idea? I mean, wouldn't a lightning bolt from heaven get their attention more effectively? And God says no. As a matter of fact, Acts chapter 17 tells us that every single one of us, that God foreordained that we would live at this exact time in human history and that we live exactly where we are living right now for a purpose. And God says the reason is that I want people who are far from God to know that God is not very far away. For me, that messenger was just two doors down. Just two doors down. So this leads to our key question today found on 320 of your Believe book, a question we're going to ask and answer today. How do I share my faith with those who don't know God? In my experience, this idea of sharing our faith is a bit of a scary thing. Uh, Research tells us that in any congregation, only 5% of the congregation is made up of gifted evangelists, people who feel very comfortable in sharing and expressing their faith to others. That leaves 95% of us a little bit unsure of how to go about this. I think it's a bit of a, a speech thing as well. Remember Moses when God called him to share his faith by telling Pharaoh, face on, let my people go. He said, God, I think you got the wrong person here. I don't really know how to speak. So I think we struggle with speaking, but I think it's deeper than that. I think we fear rejection. We have a relationship with somebody and we feel desperately that they would be helped by having a relationship with God and bring so much freedom and relief to them. But we're afraid that if we bring it up and they reject the message, what if they reject us and then the relationship goes south? And so oftentimes we hold back. In this chapter, there's two more principles I want to share with you to help each one of us with this God-sized assignment that we've been given. On page 325 of your Believe book, or tucked in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, uh, Dr. Luke gives us insight into the very first church that was founded in the city of Jerusalem. And in this verse 47, he gives this report about the effect of the church in the community. He said, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. In this very launch of the church, people were not just coming to Christ on Sunday, but they were coming to Christ seven days a week. Now, I want you to look back at the beginning of this paragraph, and he gives us what these early believers devoted their life to that sparked this kind of result. It said that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Four things they devoted themselves to. You'll notice that one of their devotions was not to evangelism, and yet people were coming to Christ every single day. So what does that teach us? That these people devoted themselves to these four things, not to evangelism, and yet every day people are falling on their knees 
in obedience to Christ. Write this next principle down. Living your faith is the best way to share your faith. Living your faith is the best way to share your faith. The biggest attraction to Christ is when his people are living authentically like him every day of the week. Not just on Sundays, but in the workplace, in the home, in the neighborhood, at the school, or wherever you go. For me, as, as, as a young uh, boy, what really drew me to Christ were men, uh, fathers and husbands, uh, Ray Teeter, Randy Taylor, Tom Shoemaker, Al Batanti. Al Batanti is my father-in-law. And each of these men uh, had just such a wonderful, genuine, simple relationship with Christ. And the way they treated people, the way they treated their wives, the way that they raised their kids just drew me in. It was the way in which they lived that drew me in. You see, discipleship of God's people is the best strategy that we have for evangelism. And that's the mission of Westside Family Church, for you to become more like Jesus. When this happens, when you progressively become more like Jesus every single day, and then you take Jesus wherever you go, it just happens. Lost people who are far from God find God. And so as a church, as a leadership, we are betting the farm on your spiritual growth because when you grow, the church grows. Amen. When you devote yourself to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship and the breaking of bread, we see the same results that happened in the first century, and that is the Lord added to our number daily those who were being saved. That's principle number two. But not only are you called to live out your faith, the Bible clearly teaches that you need to speak up. Write this down. Speaking up about your faith when the time is right. Not only living it, that's important. That's like job number one. If you live inconsistent with, the, with, the, with your uh, relationship with Christ, your words are going to fall on deaf ears. But when you're living consistently out your faith, whatever God has given you at that moment, there's going to come a time when you're required to speak up. I love the Old Testament story of a guy named Naaman. Maybe some of you have not heard this story. It's not often told. It's found on page 323 of your Believe book. It's also tucked away in a less read book called 2 Kings chapter 5. So this guy Naaman, he is the commander of the army for the king of Aram. Uh, Aram is a, a place north and west of Israel, and the people of Aram, including Naam, Naaman, is not a follower of God. And life is going great for Naaman. I mean, he's got a killer job. He reports directly to the king. He's got a wife, a family. Everything's going great for him until one day the doctor tells him, you've got leprosy, and everything changes. Now, the story picks up in verse 2 of 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman and his soldiers are on a raid, and this is what we're told. Now, bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. Here's a young girl, a teenager, who is kidnapped from her home, and she's taken to a foreign land, and she is made a slave girl to Naaman's wife. What a terrible thing that has happened to her. What, um, can you imagine the trauma in her life as a young girl? Maybe some of you find yourself in your own Aram today. Uh, you're in a place you never really wanted to be. And you are asking God, what is this all about? Yet, God has this girl at the right place, at the right time. He is writing a story for not only her life, but for other people's lives, particularly the family of Naaman. And he has her right there at the right time. Acts chapter 17, in full force. And courageously, we're going to see this young slave girl speak up at just the right time. And she says something to Naaman's wife, that changes everything. Take a look at verse three. She says, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of leprosy. Now, under normal circumstances, a slave 
girl would never speak up to the commander of the army or his wife for that matter, for she would be laughed at, she would be dismissed, or more likely she would be punished. But Naaman and his family are in crisis, and therefore that changes everything. It's hard to speak to people about their faith, people who are far from God, when their life is going great. You ever try to do that? So I've made a commitment. Whenever I am with, uh, in a relationship with somebody who is far from God, I simply make the commitment that I'm going to live out my faith as authentically as I can before them, just waiting for the wheels of their wagon to fall off. And whenever their life comes apart, I'm typically one of the first people they call. And now they are all ears. Naaman, the commander of the army in this rare occasion, listens to a young slave girl from Israel. And he goes to the king of Aram, his boss, and gets a pile of cash to take the journey to Israel to meet up with the prophet, the prophet, a guy by the name of Elisha. And the king of Aram, his boss, sends a letter ahead of Naaman to the king of Israel, who happens, like many of the kings during this era, to be a believer in God, but an evil king. And when the king of Israel receives the letter from the king of Aram telling him that he is sending the commander of his army to be healed of leprosy, (laughs) listen to what the king of Israel says. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. Here's an important lesson for us. We do not heal. We do not save. It is God who heals. It is God who saves. It is only our responsibility to be ambassadors, to be messengers. So Naaman finally meets up with the prophet Elijah. Actually, he doesn't meet up with Elisha. Elisha sends one of his servants to meet up with Naaman, and it ticks Naaman off. He is the big commander of the army of King Aram. He has brought a pile of cash, and he demands to meet with the big prophet, Elisha. And Elisha's servant says, Elisha told me to tell you to go down into the River Jordan and bathe yourself, wash yourself seven times, and you will be healed. (laughs) Well, Naaman is offended and he objects. And you know why? Because this is a pride issue. And you know what I've discovered? I've discovered that the single greatest barrier to your family and friends and coworkers uh, to come to know Christ is pride. At the end of the day, I have, I have seen some of the most intelligent people in all the world eventually come to Christ. And at first, they'll put up an intellectual argument. They have all kinds of arguments. But at the end of the day, it wasn't the intellect. It was pride. It is essential for a person to let down their pride in order to come to Christ. So uh, Naaman gets boastful and he says to the servant, which he doesn't think he should be talking to, why would I go bathe myself in the Jordan rivers? Are the waters of Damascus where I'm from not pure enough for you? And so he refuses So the servants that are traveling with Naaman, uh, his entourage, if you will, uh, pulls him aside and they say this to Naaman. They said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you wash and be cleansed? Essentially, they're saying, Naaman, you have come all this way. Oh, by the way, do we need to remind you that you're like deathly sick? Put your pride down and take a stinking bath in the River Jordan. What do you have to lose? Naaman decides to swallow his pride. He decides to humble himself, which I say to you again, is always essential for us to come to God. We have to let go and we have to give it up. We have to swallow our pride. And he does it. And he takes the plunge into the waters of the Jordan. He does what Elijah suggests which is obviously a picture of being washed clean by the blood of Jesus. He instantly is healed. Now listen to this. He comes out of the water and he makes this declaration. 
Then Naaman and all of his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. He's coming out of the baptismal waters, if you will, and he is declaring public his profession of belief in the God, the one true God. And none of this would have happened if it weren't for the courage of a scared young slave girl who spoke up when the time is right. And this is the call of God on our life that we would live our life before the world in such a way that we show them all of Jesus that we have currently taken in, nothing more, nothing less. And then when the moment is right, like this slave girl, we would speak up so that another person might grab hold of the true confession. I just got back, as some of you know, from Hong Kong a couple days ago. And I was invited there uh, because there are literally hundreds of churches in Hong Kong that are engaging in an amazing journey for Lent or in preparation for Easter where they have created an app, an audio Bible, and have committed uh, to listening to the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts every day over the next 47 days in preparation for Easter. And they invited me over because of my passion uh, for seeing God's people engage in God's Word as the single greatest catalyst for one's spiritual growth. And what a privilege it was for me. So they created this app. Matter of fact, I'm going to encourage you to download it. If if you go to just one, hearing the word, one, hearing the word, you can download this app that will lead you into listening to the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, as well as a prayer and a testimony and a devotional every day leading up to Easter. Uh, When I was there just a couple of days ago, it was the number one downloaded app on Lifestyle, and it was the number three downloaded loaded app in all the world of free apps that are available. It's an amazing thing to see this, but they're not only doing it with inside of the church. The big push is that they're inviting other people far from God in Hong Kong to join in in this experience. If you download the app, it's going to ask you uh, what church you're part of, and you'll scroll to hundreds of churches in Hong Kong. And then when you get to the W, you're going to find Westside Family Church. They've added our church and invited us to participate as brothers and sisters in Christ. And not only you taking in the word of God in preparation for Easter, but to dare you to invite someone far from God in your space to join in with us. And when I was over in Hong Kong, as as you might suspect, I ended up uh, receiving more from the brothers and sisters there than I felt like I deposited. And one of the things that I learned was that the people of Hong Kong at least in my opinion, seem to be more aggressive or proactive in sharing their faith than we are here in the United States. I mean, it's, it's, it really was quite astounding to me. And I, I don't know exactly what the reason is. Maybe, you know, Hong Kong borders, you know, mainland China. And when you make a commitment to your faith, you better be sure that this is the truth. And they're pretty excited about it. I'll give you one example. I went while I was there to a birthday party for a guy named George So. Uh, he's 60 years old, a very prominent businessman in Hong Kong who has done a lot for Christ, not only in the support of ministries, but is in his personal witness to his friends and to his family. So I'm at this um, birthday party that was a surprise to him, and the room is filled with people who've been touched by George So. And it's very clear in the room. Everybody's talking about it. The three tables in the back are filled with people in George's life who don't believe in Jesus. Everybody in the room knows it. And they're actually talking about it up front as people are giving presentations. And I'm thinking to myself, this seems inappropriate to me. You know, to be like calling these people out as non-believers. But George's passion in life is to see his friends come to know Jesus. And so at one point in the event, a group of friends of his, business guys uh, from the Full Gospel Men's Business Fellowship, people dedicated to Jesus, get up and they sing and they dedicate the song to these three tables. It's called the Happy Man Song. OK, I just couldn't help but take a video of these guys singing and dancing. Take a watch of this.
Isn't that the coolest thing you've ever seen? Later in the evening, uh, those three tables get up to pay their respect to George, and they thanked him for his consistent witness, and they promised in front of the whole group that they would actually consider it. I thought that was the coolest thing. So, so later on, I thought that was maybe kind of a fluke experience. So later on, I'm doing a TV interview for this experience, and I'm being interviewed by a wonderful Christian host, and uh, uh, there's a gal interpreting for me in Cantonese, and we're having this wonderful experience. And the lady who brought me, uh, a lady from Hong Kong by the name of Linda, while I'm doing the interview, she's talking to the producer of the television show. And apparently, she'd have never met him. She just simply says, are you a believer in Jesus? And apparently, the guy said no. So when we're done with the interview, she yells across the room in the studio, hey, Randy, Spree, which is his English name, Spree doesn't know Jesus. I'm like, jeez, I mean, can't you wait till Spree leaves the room? It's like, Spree doesn't know Jesus. And I ask him, it would be okay if you prayed for him to receive Jesus. I'm like, okay. And so we finish the whole event with the, a bunch of us in a circle, and we're praying for Spree. And when I finished praying for him, tears were strolling down his face. And it is my opinion that Spree is just hours away from receiving eternal life because Linda had the courage to speak up when the time was right. I didn't tell this story in the other services, but I'll tell it in this service. There's one particular time when I got about as bold as I've ever been in sharing my faith. You know, I grew up in an unchurched home, and when I was 17, my mom came to Christ, but my dad never really had any interest. Matter of fact, he kept my mom from really pursuing her faith. And then when my mom died of pancreatic cancer, unexpectedly at the age of 62, uh, from Cleveland, Ohio, we were getting ready. Our kids were much younger back then. We were getting ready to fly back to Fort Worth, Texas. And I told my wife, I said, I've had it. I said, you take the kids out the subway and don't come back until I call you. And I locked my dad in the house. And he was sitting in his easy chair. And my dad is a very emotional guy. Whenever you get two personal. He always left the room when I was a kid because he couldn't handle it. And so what I did is I wrote him a letter and I went to his easy chair and I straddled it so he couldn't get up. And I said, dad, we just buried mom and there's, and and, and I'm not leaving here until you say once and for all, yes or no about Jesus. And you can tell he was getting nervous and wanted to get up. And I just held him down and I said, I'm going to give you this letter to read and you read this letter, and I mean it, Dad. And if you say no, then I'll be done forever. But I am not coming back to Cleveland, Ohio again to bury you knowing that you haven't accepted Jesus. Okay? All right. So I gave him the letter, and I walked out of the room, making sure he didn't leave. When I came back in, my full-grown dad was weeping. Tears were strolling down his face. And I said, Dad, would you like to accept Christ? And he said, yes. I was so scared, but the time was right, and he said yes. It's pretty cool, right? My dad, not only is this happening in Hong Kong and in my life, but I'm going to hear to tell you that it's happening at Westside Family Church. I'm so very proud of you. So many stories to share, but here's one that came to my attention from our Austin Speedway campus. Take a look at this. My husband uh, went to middle school with Ryan Parker, and so when Brandon and I got married, I inherited the Parker clan, (laughs) and uh, we just became really good friends, and they invited us to Westside many times. Back when we were doing the people you wanted to pray for and you put people on a list, Brandon and Jody were on my list. Oh, I'd probably been inviting Brandon to come to things for quite a while. After he went through a divorce with his first wife, I'd invite him to firesides or just whatever. And then just eventually that turned into invites with Jody, also both of them. And just being there as she was going through times after uh, loss of her grandfather. Well, last fall, my grandfather had passed away and he was a very, very important person in my life. And I felt a little lost at his funeral, they had read his testimony, and I learned so much about him, about different experiences in his life that I wasn't aware of, and his faith and love for God uh, was tremendous, and he helped so many people uh, get to that point. 
So I knew he knew something wonderful and great, and I really wanted to know what it was. So uh, we decided to start going to church, and uh, we decided to come here to Westside at the Speedway with Ryan and Michelle, and um, it's been a life changer, basically. <laughs> uh, you could tell that she was trying to absorb everything and that she was like open to what was going on. And When I started coming to Westside, um, my first three uh, attendances were basically in tears. But I had that feeling that, you know, that one moment that all of a sudden I had this pain in my heart and my heart just kind of opened up and I was like, is that a heart attack or is it, oh, it's, it feels, but it feels really good. I didn't know what it was. Um, but it was just, you know, my heart opening up to God. And it was pretty much at that moment, it's like, you know, Jesus is my savior. This is where I need to be. You know, this is my new life. When I heard Jody was going to be baptized, uh, that's really cool because that's just such an expression of where we're at in our faith when we understand that, that we're dying with Christ to be raised again. So of course I had to be there front row and crying while I watched her get baptized because I was so excited. Well, without the invitation that the Parkers gave many times over, um, I don't believe that I would be where I'm at right now. Yeah, so Brandon's daughter came to the women's conference Saturday, his youngest daughter, and... Uh... She accepted Jesus, and she decided to be baptized. <laughs> you know, the invitation from the Parkers extended to us, and then now it has extended to our daughter. It is definitely so a God thing, and there's always these times in life where you feel like the Holy Spirit's telling you, hey, tell this person this, or ask this person this. I was very lost after my grandfather's death, and so that invitation was right there within reach, and it made it very simple for me to find a church. I love them and adore them, and, um, and thank you, thank you. When you're faithful in those things that God tells you to do, and, and then when he allows you the opportunity to have a front row seat to watch it come to fruition, wow. That is the essence of this final spiritual practice of living out your faith, sharing my faith. And today we've opened up the scriptures to unlock this door for you. I'm going to invite you to say the key idea with me, church. Ready? I share my faith with others to fulfill God's purposes. Now I'm going to invite you to have the courage to walk through this door to be a witness for Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask you this question. Who? Who has God placed in your life at this time? Who is far from him? That it is time for you to speak up and to invite them. Did you know that 51% of people said on the outside that they would come if someone on the inside would just invite them? Who? A little pastoral moment here. If you don't have somebody who is far from God in your life right now, you may be just hanging out too much with Christians. <laughs> Time for you to get your hands dirty and look at the life of Jesus and look who we had dinner with so that you have someone in your life that you might have the amazing joy of inviting into this space that will change their lives forever. The Apostle Paul gives us our key verse today in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. He writes, Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray for me that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. The Apostle Paul, without question, was one of the most one of the most committed, gifted evangelists in the first 60 years of the unfolding of the church, and yet he described that he was sometimes afraid to share his faith. If it's okay for Paul to be a little nervous about sharing his faith, then it's certainly okay for us. And so as we close this service, I want to do exactly what Paul has asked us to do for him, and I want to pray for you. 
I want to pray for you to have the courage to invite and to share your faith because someone did it for you. And so as we close in prayer, I'm just going to ask you, even online, if you want me to pray for you, signify by just raising your hand so I know who I'm praying for. Anybody want me to pray for them to have the courage to share their faith? Heavenly Father, I thank you for those who have had their hands raised. And I now pray for them that you would give them boldness and wisdom to do exactly what Ray and Mary Graham did for me and what the slave girl from Israel did for Naaman and his family. And that has to speak up when the time is right. And in the meantime, that we would live our faith before people, revealing who you are, drawing people closer to you. That we might be responsible and experience the exhilaration of participating as ambassadors of yours to bring people into this amazing life. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. A couple things before we leave. Number one, uh, on April the 20th and 21st, which is Easter weekend, uh, we're going to have a blowout baptism experience. How cool would it be for you to be baptized on Easter, like Nahum coming out of the waters of Jordan and declaring that he is the one true God in your life. Wow, that would be so cool. One in 14 of you, we have statistics show that you haven't made that commitment. I recommend Easter as a really good time to sort of like humble yourself and go into the rivers of Jordan and come out a new person, okay? So I would love to have you baptized then. And if you would just simply go to westsidefamily.church forward slash baptism and sign up, there's a class that we want you to go to so you know what it's all about. And then we will be celebrating Easter Resurrection Sunday, your baptism, okay? So be thinking about that. Number two, we have a very practical class next Sunday here at the Lenexa campus at 1215 uh, on how to share your faith. And so you can sign up for that class by going to westsidefamily.church forward slash share Jesus or go out into our connection center and we can have some people answer questions for you about just sort of breaking this down and giving you a training on how to share your faith. And finally, uh, after the service today, our prayer uh, partners will be down here. They would love to pray for whatever burden you brought into this room today. Uh, or if you'd like to receive Christ today as your savior, They would love, love, love to pray and talk to you about that. Now, how cool would that be? Amen. And finally, next week, we're going to be uh, we're going to begin the final 10 weeks of our belief series, the one that I've been waiting for all along, where God and his word is going to lay out chapter by chapter the vision of the kind of person you were created to be. And we're going to lay that out, and it should draw you closer to Christ like nothing you have ever seen before. Which, guess what? This provides for you a great opportunity to invite somebody to see what the Christian life is all about. And maybe, just maybe, because you had the courage to invite, you're going to see somebody come to know Jesus and get on with this abundant life. Amen? Okay, be standing to your feet. Let me leave you with this blessing. Now go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Honor all people. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. And share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Have a great day, church.